like tonight to, to introduce Cheryl Spaulding, who is going to be our moderator. There's, some, there's two seats up front for those of you that need seats. And there's more seats over here, so there's plenty of seats up front. Um, Cheryl uh, is a former legislator and has written a really uh, good editorial that she is going to talk about that is on our mainstream website, mainstreamcoalition.org. And Cheryl um, and I go way back. She was on this, the Blue Valley School Board when I worked in Blue Valley. So uh, I have known Cheryl for a long time, and she's a very reasonable person and will be a really good moderator for this forum. Thank you. Well, hi, and, and welcome to everybody. I want to thank you for coming tonight. I really appreciate your being here, and I'm looking forward as well as you are to what we're going to hear tonight. Uh, we've got two wonderful guests. Uh, probably two people who don't need much introduction, and I will give them a chance to be introduced in a second. But before we do, I want to say just a few words myself. Um, and that has to do with the outcome of the election. Uh, election night statewide, nationally, uh, was not what many of us were hoping for. <laughs> but there were a few bright spots. Mainstream PAC, in its first attempt to do more than endorse and send checks, had a pretty good evening here. Uh, in the nine races that our group targeted with money, campaign literature, and or canvassing and, and getting volunteers for, in the primary or the general elections, we won six of those. We maintained all of our incumbents, all of our friendly incumbents. And in addition, an open seat that had been held by a friend and was now an open seat was also maintained by a friend that we endorsed. So we thought that was great. And in addition, we also gained another moderate seat here in Johnson County. So not everything is, is as bad as it sounded at first blush. In many respects, we were very close to making a huge change. And I want you to know, because I am assuming all of you are voters and that's why you're here. Uh, that several legislative positions across the state were won or lost by fewer than 100 votes. Some of the margins were so close, they were decided almost a week later. So every single vote counts, and so we thank you for voting. The bottom line is, is that now that we've taken stands here in mainstream, from everything from support of our teachers in public education, to a fairer tax system, we must not back down. Now that we've begun organizing and found like minds, we must continue. It literally took the Koch brothers decades to figure out how to win elections, and this is the culmination of all that effort. We need to stand with those who are disenfranchised, the working poor without insurance, the disabled and the elderly, and the families who take care of those people. They can't quit their lives. And we shouldn't let them down by quitting either. Despite all the lies and all the money that were thrown into the campaigns, we nearly won. We nearly won. If we believe what we said during the elections, that Brownback's cuts will cause more chaos and harm, then others will want to join us. And we need to let them know that we are ready to stand with them. And there are lots of groups across the state that agree with us, and they are not willing to quit either. They are going to continue to work. So I thank you again very much for coming. And I want to um, I'll let you know that while they're talking, if you come up with questions, there are cards on every, on every seat, I believe, or there are going to be cards handed out. Uh, this gentleman over here has cards to hand to you. You want to write down your questions, that would be great. And they're going to be handed up and we'll ask those questions. Uh, if you've got something that you want to suggest for mainstream, something you think we need to do that we're not doing, put that on the bottom and say, here's a suggestion we think mainstream ought to do. If you didn't get a chance to put your email address on the back and you would like to get our updates, because all during the session, we put updates on our emails, and we'll send those out to you, what's going on legislatively. If you want to get those, please make sure we've captured your email. So with that, let me say, we've got two people here I'm, I'm real excited about introducing. Uh, Dr. Michael Smith from Emporia State and Dr. Burdett Loomis. They write in a number of different newspapers across the state, and many of you probably are already familiar with them. 
So for a change, I'm going to let them tell you what they want you to know about themselves. And we'll start with Michael, Dr. Michael Smith. Thank you for the introduction. I teach at Emporia State. I teach uh, state and local politics, political philosophy, and, and uh, campaigns and elections. That might be something you might be interested in talking about tonight, and a, a few other things. Um, Lisa emailed us a couple of questions to get us going um, for the discussion tonight and asked that we take about 10 minutes each just to kind of set up sort of a state of the state, state of this is where we are in, in the state and, and national politics and so forth. And uh, the two questions were, we got from you all were, uh, how bad are things going to get? <laughs> and what we're going to do about the budget? Um, and so I'll, I'll try. <laughs> um, how bad are things going to get? Um, depends on your perspective. Um, if you just look at the politics of the situation, my recommendation um, is, and first of all, congratulations on, on Mainstream's victories. That's, that's, you know, I, we could see that Mainstream was really getting more politically sophisticated in the last few years and really hit the ground running in this election was starting to target elections, target races, target voters, and, and obviously it worked for them. Um, but of course, a lot of other candidates that, that Mainstream would have liked to have seen win, won, did not win. Um, Remember the big picture, though. Remember two years ago, two comments, the kind of things that are often written off as gaffes, but I love the quote, I think it was Michael Kinsley, who was the editor of the New Republic. Uh, um, he has this wonderful quote, and I probably overquote it, but I just, I just love it. He said, the definition of a gaffe is when a politician accidentally says what he really thinks. <laughs> and I think that's spot on. And, and if you think about Mitt Romney's 47% you know, that think they're entitled to food, which is true, I think I'm entitled to food, and, um, and will never vote for conservative Republicans. Um, and then, of course, Bill O'Reilly's it's not Warden June Cleaver's America anymore. It's not our America anymore comments on Fox News when Ohio was about to come in for Obama mm -hmm. on election night. That's the bigger picture. And, and I think a lot of conservative Republicans know that. Um, I have made it my business to become something of an antagonist to uh, Secretary of State Kobach. <laughs> I wasn't fishing for applause. I, <laughs> really, really. If I'm fishing for applause, you'll know it. But, um, um, I don't agree that there's research to back up these claims of voter fraud. I have not done the research myself. I've read what others have done, and, and I don't see it. And, and my, the research is coming in, including some that I've done, showing that there is a suppression of voter turnout from the laws that he champions. Um, but why in the world would he do that? Why in the world would the Republican Party bet on a horse like Chris Tobach, <laughs> who is so heavily invested in preventing people from voting? Um, and it's because of this fear that, you know, it's what Bill, Bill O'Reilly said on election night, it's not our America anymore. The Republican Party, which I know is a party that many of you at one time identified with, some of you may still, uh, it's, you know, had a proud moderate wing and moderate tradition in Kansas for mo maybe all the state's history, well, except when it was radical. Uh, but since then, you know, from Nancy Kasselman to Bill Graves to Bob Dole to, to, to Governor Bennett, to all these people, and, and I respect that. But So when I say the Republican Party, I'm talking about what it's become, just, just so we're clear on that. And, and what it's become is the party of older married white people. The Republican Party is the party of older married white people. And that's it. Um, and not even all of those. Um, and demographically, that is a time bomb because that's not the future of this country. You know, the nation's largest state, California, has not been predominantly white for more than 10 years now. The nation's second largest state and a bulwark of republicanism, Texas, is about to flip to no longer being a predominantly white state anymore. Uh, Democrats might be a little premature in predicting that it's going to go democratic, but, but it is about to go majority-minority. That, that, that's demographic reality. Um, as much as it's, it's a struggle about defining ourselves and, and morally and culturally, you know, 
many, many young Americans, including those who have children, choose not to be married. And the percentage of people never married is going up and probably will continue going up. That's just reality. Um, and, and it doesn't look good for the Republicans. I, I know for the conservative, you know, that for the, the right wing that's currently controlling the Republican Party, yeah, they had a great year. They had a fantastic year in 2014. They are opening the champagne bottles. It's life is good for now. But demographically, it's a time bomb. Uh, I said at our, our Dole Institute forum with, with Bird and others uh, that uh, Chris Kobach is a great benefit to the Democratic Party. <laughs> and I really believe that because he is actively hostile to key blocks of voters that Republicans have to win or they have no chance of holding on to a majority in the future. None. And that's why people like Karl Rove, of whom I'm no fan, but he does have some political skills, has pled with the Republican Party, do not alienate Latino voters. You can't. Demographically, we're done as a party if you do this. Um, you know, I, I think he and a lot of other Republican strategists that take a longer view were probably grieving on election night that Kobach was, was reelected because that's more damage control for them. And they can only do so much damage control. Uh, and so in the short run, congratulations to the conservative wing of the Republican Party, or the right wing. Bert doesn't like calling them conservatives. And he's right. It's a, that's kind of a misuse of the word conservative. The, the right wing of the Republican Party. A great year. You know, job well done. You, know, you, lo you won. We lost. But, but longer term, there's so much fear. You see it in the support for someone like Kobach, which is completely unnecessary. There's no voter fraud. There's, there's almost no documented instances of voter fraud. Completely unnecessary. There are any number of other people they could run for Secretary of State, but pick him, and I imagine he'll run for governor or senate or something. He's an ambitious man. Um, there, there's no reason for this kind of active hostility to the key growing blocks of voters. But the flip side of that is, that these key growing blocks of voters may not like where the Republican Party has gone, but they also don't vote in low turnout elections. The, the voter turnout numbers were horrid. And it's, it's not mainstream members that didn't turn out. Mainstream members, mainstream supporters did turn out. It's lower income, heavily minority, younger voters. Look at the numbers from Wyandotte County for voter turnout. They're atrocious. Mm -hmm. There's no chance for Democrats or a Democrat moderate to co coalition to win with turnout numbers like that in Wyandotte County. Mm -hmm. There's no chance for a Kelly Coltsla. There's no way with those kind of turnout numbers. Um, North Wichita, East Topeka, these, these places have got to turn out because these are the voters in play. You know, that they are not going to vote for the Republicans, but are they going to vote at all? Um, and uh, there's a bare coalition in presidential elections that forms a majority. And by the way, Republicans are very nervous. Again, I'm talking about the new, the conservative wing of the Republicans. Very nervous about 2016 because the numbers don't look good. I, I saw one columnist from the Houston Chronicle that looked at all of the safe Democratic states, just the safe Democratic states in 2016, and it's almost 270 electoral votes, just the safe states, you know, New York and Massachusetts and California and all these other states. The Democrats almost have 270 just in the safe states. Um, and so what we're seeing, in my opinion, is a coalition of, of older white people living in rural and ex-urban areas um, that are clinging, hanging on for dear life. And of course, in a state like Kansas, that's a higher percentage of the population than in, say, California. And so, of course, we're going to see the impact of that in a state like Kansas. Um, so that's kind of my long view of where we are. On the budget, I have no idea. <laughs> I know you all are very astute, you follow the news, you've heard a few Republican legislators have made a few peeps about we may have to revisit taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Will that lead to anything? I mean, we know that ideologically, if you really push 
the right wing and, and, and really just kind of pin them down, okay, yeah, you got to have some taxes so government can function. They tend to prefer sales taxes to income taxes. Um, now, of course, sales taxes can be highly regressive, so that's a problem. Kansas Democrats have been trying for years unsuccessfully to take the sales tax off groceries. Um, but nevertheless, it is a form of revenue. Um, and, and so my, my guess is if they do put taxes on the table, in addition to maybe relooking at some loopholes they created a few years ago, the other place they may go is to start to look at sales taxes. And I doubt that, that there will be an exemption for groceries and things like that, but, but it would be a source of revenue. Um, and um, of course, the highway trust fund money may not be long for this world. Uh, and we're digging through the couch cushions looking for whatever we can find. But that's one-time money. That's not going to support the state on a, a sustaining basis. The other issue is with the schools. And a big chunk of this is about the school-based funding formula. We know that. That's a big chunk of the budget. That's where a big part of the hit in the budget was taken. That the school districts are, are going to fall back and already are falling back more on property taxes. Um, uh, now, here in Johnson County, of course, there's a pretty good base of property values to levy that tax on. Small levy increases can generate a lot of money. Um, and I'm not saying that those cuts wouldn't still be felt here, because they would. But what I really worry about is some of the poorer rural communities. Uh, you know, the, the Cherokee counties, the, the Trago counties, in Lyon County, where I teach, is one of the poorest counties in the state. Um, and, and it's much harder in a community where if you picked up one of these houses around here that's worth maybe uh, $250,000 and dropped it, the lot, the maintenance, everything in Emporia, it'd be worth 10 to 20 percent what it is here. And it's very hard to get revenue from the schools out of the property taxes. So um, I, I actually worry less about the prairie villages of the state than I do about the emporias of the state, mm -hmm. because it's going to be a bigger hit. But that is another source of filling that budget gap, is for the school districts to fall back on property taxes. But the reason we have a school-based funding formula in the first place is because of the inequality. Uh, that communities like this can raise so much more money for their local schools than Emporia can because of the property values in the area. That's why we passed the school-based funding formula in the first place. In fact, there were, it was under the threats of lawsuits. It was to settle lawsuits. And that's another variable. Wouldn't that be interesting if it went back into the courts? Um, so that's another thing to look out for. Of course, Governor Brownback has changed the way appellate court judges are appointed, but so far not other judges. Um, and so, you know, that's another thing to keep an eye on. Because actually already they had to put some more money into a court ruling. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe sales taxes, I'm totally speculating, uh, rating the highway trust fund, uh, and then property taxes to shore up lost revenue locally, but that's very uneven would be my best guesses, and that's all they are about what's going to happen with the budget. But uh, Bird might have some better ideas, so uh, I think it's about time for him to take. Th thanks, Michael, and, and thanks for for uh, in inviting me over uh, when uh, I was informed there was going to be a big crowd tonight. I had to make this a joint meeting of the uh, uh, the mainstream coalition and the Johnson County Massacres. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and, and I, I, you know, I, uh, the fact that before I, when I, when I came in, and she said, you know, you seem to be more pleasant before. Now you mean, you've gotten you know, nastier. And I said, hey, you know, uh, I, I think I, I, I'm, te I'm very uh, capable of delivering bad news. Uh, but, but I don't think I've gotten nastier. I, I think things have gotten nastier. Uh, so thanks for coming out. I'm re very serious. Uh, that that's that's really important. Uh, and uh, I was going to talk about you know this 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 uh, really really serious defeat and, and how the, the the city was taking it. Um, 
and I decided not to talk about KU basketball. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, let me talk a little bit about the election and, and, and segue a little bit in, 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 into, the, into the budget. Um, I mean, first of all, we know the polls were wrong. They were wrong um, across the country. It was a big democratic uh, uh, bubble that, was, that wasn't there, uh, more so in Kansas than other places, to tell, to tell you the truth. Um, I think that some people picked it up. Uh, uh, the Republican uh, consultant Jeff Farrell has a pollster, and on the day of the camp, on the day of the election, his pollster and Jeff Farrell brings the press in and talks on election day. And his uh, pollster said uh, that Orman was going to win by at least six percentage points, and Farrell said, "I'm not. We're not going to publish that. We're not going to. That's crazy." Uh, it looked like a very, very close race, uh, both for Senate uh, and and, for, and uh, certainly. Uh, Paul Davis looked like he was he was, he was favored. Uh, so what happened? Um, my overall gross interpretation is that uh, Pat Roberts got into terrific trouble as of the primary. Uh, he clearly was going to have a very difficult time. Uh, Chad Taylor dropped out, for better or for worse, but dropped out, uh, and a wave of a big wave of Republican money came in that would not have come in otherwise. The Republican Governors Association came in with a lot of money. Chris Christie and, and, and uh, $130 million across the country. Uh, so they came in big in Kansas. Uh, but other sources came in for Roberts. And I think all that money for Roberts clearly paid off. And I think it made the, the, the electorate more Republican. Now you go to the exit polls, and it doesn't look that way. There are 48% Republican, 25% uh, Democratic, the rest uh, unaffiliated independents. A lot of those independents are Republicans. Um, the other thing that happened is uh, Republicans came home. I think those, I, uh, Nancy Lass gave me her uh, wonderful, I say wonderful in quotes, uh, uh, selection of, of, of uh, flyers that were mailed out against her, I mean, one after another, after another, after another. Uh, and, and so uh, it's, this beating, uh, I think uh, you, you see that in commercials, you see it uh, in, in, the, uh, in the flyers, and I really think that drove uh, the electorate back to being uh, more more Republican than it would have been, say, in September. Um, and ironically, the, the weakest Senate candidate in the country, Pat Roberts, uh, had coattails that helped Sam Brownback win the election. I'm totally convinced of that, without uh, without any in, any any question. Um, here's what didn't happen: Paul Davis didn't lose this election. Paul Davis ran a pretty good campaign. Our, our group have some differences about what Paul Davis should or shouldn't have done. Uh, let's be clear, Paul Davis, uh, relative to Obama's performance in 2012, got, uh, was the best performing governor or senator candidate in the country. So he improved his performance over Obama in 2012 better than any governor, candidate, gubernatorial, <coughs> senatorial candidate in the country. That's not a bad campaign. Uh, I don't think he made any serious mistakes. Uh, we can argue whether he could have been more forceful, uh, uh, but uh, this was really a, a, can, uh, a campaign that was judging Sam Brownback. Uh, and even though 50-some percent uh, thought the Brownback policies were uh, going the wrong direction, uh, a greater percentage felt that Obama was a problem. So, that, so one of the things that the, the Roberts money did was to nationalize the campaign. To nationalize the campaign, it's, a, it's a much more of a hill for Paul Davis uh, to, to, uh, to, to climb. Um, I do think that we got a lot of, a lot of attention on voter restrictions. Uh, they didn't determine the election. Uh, it's often that 22,000 people didn't vote. Uh, uh, most of those people wouldn't have voted anyway. Uh, uh, 
that, that those people who, who were in, in limbo, um, and you might have gotten the two or 3,000 extra votes if everyone had voted or, or a substantial number had voted. Uh, that wasn't going to change the election. Now, I completely agree with what Michael was saying. As a long-term strategy, voter suppression is really important to, to the uh, Republican Party uh, uh, to the extent that it, it can make the electorate smaller and make it more difficult to vote. Absolutely. That didn't, that didn't uh, determine the election this year. Um, Democratic turnout was okay. It wasn't great. It wasn't bad. It was about the same as 2010. Uh, 2010, you know, there, there were hardly any real, real, uh, you know, no statewide, serious statewide races at all in 2010. But there was a huge Republican wave. So more contested elections, uh, less Republican enthusiasm, um, sort of evened out. Uh, but some of the turnout, as Mike has already mentioned, wind out and truly ter terrible. But even even Douglas County Lawrence uh, uh, didn't turn out the way I think we had anticipated. Uh, and uh, uh, Johnson, Johnson County, I was in the room at, at Paul Davis's um, uh, event, I was going to say celebration, <laughs> event, uh, and at quarter of nine, things were looking great. At 10 after nine, the, the room was pretty much a, a silent because Johnson County had come in. And yeah, there were, there were three or 4,000 votes down in Johnson County. And that really was it. Uh, I'm not blaming you. Uh, uh, so, what do we have here? Uh, we've got 97 Republicans, some of them moderate. We can argue or can try to figure out how many of, the, of those folks are moderate. Uh, 28 Democrats, uh, 32 to 8 in the Senate. So, uh, really uh, severe. Uh, Republican minorities, uh, Democrats are at great disadvantage uh, in, in both chambers. Uh, conservative Republicans, right-wing Republicans, yeah, control both, 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 really control both, both chambers. Does that mean that the House and the Senate and the Governor are going to be on the same page? Uh, <coughs> do you want to be on the same page as Ray Merrick? Uh, <laughs> You can't make it up. Um, they won't be to an extent. Uh, there'll be some squabbling. Uh, there, you know, Susan Weigel even, President of the Senate, talked a little bit about taxes. But don't expect there to be much daylight there. They're very, very right wing. Uh, the, this is uh, the Brownback administration. Uh, we'll, we'll see what, what, what they do. Uh, if there's any revenue enhancements uh, at, 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 at all. Uh, but boy, I think it's going to be hard to, to, uh, to pass those because I think that the, the Senate and the House will be very, very resistant to the revenue, uh, revenue enhancements. And so the, the, the quote is from Brownback's budget director, from senators, from the vaunted scholars, and the Kansas Policy Institute. Uh, live within your means. Live within. You know, you know, we'll cut. We'll, we'll cut revenues like crazy. But families have to live within their means. Um, just today, if living within your means gets harder and harder, uh, we'll see what how, how revenues come in. Uh, and certainly, Dwayne Gosen, the former budget director, is not uh, optimistic. That, that come, even, come in even as well as they're supposed to right now. Today, there are $40 million more in uh, uh, Medicaid expenses. Uh, so that's $40 more million dollars for, for the state to come up with. Uh, uh, and, and they can't print money. The federal government can print money. Uh, the, state, <laughs> the state can't. Uh, so what's going what's gonna to happen? Um, I'm not going to think about the revenue side. Uh, there might be more privatization, uh, selling the Kansas Turnpike. You know, genuinely bad idea. You know, one of the, the very best things we have. Let's sell it. Um, uh, but uh, be, be up beyond that, uh, I think you you might have been looking at the, at the at this Medicare compact. 
Uh, I don't think that will eventually go through. A, a bunch of states would say, we just want the money on Medicaid, Medicare, and we'll take care of it. Yeah. Uh, I think on education, I think you, you have majorities in both House and Senate and, the go and a governor who are perfectly happy uh, that revenues are declining. Yeah. I think that, that in a sense they'll say, okay, we'll live with our means, and hey, let's do school vouchers. Uh, and, and we'll do school vouchers for private schools, for charter schools, oh, and we'll throw in religious schools. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, I, I'm very pessimistic here. I, I think that a lot of these people are gonna embrace lower revenues, uh, and, and they're, they're going to use that as, as, as a way uh, to further shrink the size, size of government. Uh, of course, that means that the poorest Kansans will be hurt uh, the most, uh, but everybody uh, will, be, will be hurt to a certain, to a certain uh, ex extent. Um, and if you take this out a few years, one of the things that happens in, in this tax bill is that we have some further income tax cuts coming. Uh, I know you'll be extremely happy to get that extra six dollars, whatever. Uh, and so at some point, um, we, we will level off and the revenues will start to build up. I'm not sure when that is. Uh, but at some point that will happen. Now, by then we've really gone down probably a billion and a half dollars, billion dollars, billion and a half dollars, starts to grow up. When it start, when it gets to two, goes up two percent from that very low point. What happens? You have to ta cut more taxes. So in a sense, you're you're committed to that low level of spending uh, that's been art artificially dropped by uh, all these all all these tax cuts. Uh, in a sense. Uh, um, we, we, when I came here uh, uh, 35 years ago, I came from the upper Midwest. I came from Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa. And I went to Kansas and said, you know, Kansas is not, not quite in, in that progressive, quite that progressive tradition of the upper Midwest, but, but, I, but it had a lot of elements like that. So I mean, I think, I'm thinking of it as kind of a, a Kansas soda. Uh, and as I look at Kansas right now and where we're going, it's pretty clear they were headed toward Kansas City. Uh, and, and I think that there are a lot of people in the legislature, in the governor's office, that are perfectly happy with that. And that may be beyond any, any uh, number, any fiscal estimate, that may be the scariest thing, that there, there is not that commitment to good education, good roads, uh, quality, quality uh, social services. Uh, I think, can't say that Kansas has been opulent, but we've had well-run, moderate conservative government for 40 or 50 years. And uh, I see that as something coming close to be, being a thing of the, for the past. Uh, and that's my great worry uh, in, the, in the years to come. Given the recent report of additional revenue shortfall affecting the CanCare program, do you see any movement toward accepting federal uh, Medicaid expansion funds, and if so, how? Um, I don't. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> We're short. We're short. Uh, I, I don't see that. Now, I'm not really plugged in in terms of, of the ins and outs of Topeka, uh, you know, down to what individual legislators are saying off the record and so forth. I'm just thinking more about the overall direction of the state. Um, and it is true that some conservative voting states have expanded Medicare and implemented their own Obamacare exchanges instead of their folks going through the federal ones. Kentucky is the classic example. And Kentucky is a really fun one because uh, in Kentucky, uh, the plan has its own name, you know, Kentucky Care or whatever. And if you ask people their public opinion of Kentucky Care, it's much higher than the public opinion is of Obamacare, even though it's the same thing, you know, except one of them doesn't have the word Obama in it. It's, it's two different words for the same program. Uh, but but Kentucky is a state that has had a very high percentage of people without health insurance. Another one's Arkansas. 
uh, which has become very Republican recently. It didn't used to be, it was, it was Bill Clinton's home state, but, but it's become very Republican. But they just have such a huge percentage of uninsured. Uh, I think it, they, they just they put political ideology aside and the chance to do something. When you've got 20 plus percent of your people with no health insurance, that they're not really in a very good position to turn that down. Kansas, the numbers aren't nearly that high. In fact, Kansas has is, is actually usually been above average for percentage of people that have health insurance. So there's not that much pressure as there is in a Kentucky or an Arkansas. But, so again, it, it reverts back to that conservative ideology. You might remember the, the arts funding cuts from a few years ago. And of course the critics immediately made the argument, they made all sorts of arguments about the value of the arts and so forth. And, and they are valuable. Um, but one of the arguments, which is you always hear in these kind of debates, is but if you do that, you give up the federal matching funds. And if you'll remember, what they did was they restored the funding up to the minimum amount they needed to leverage federal matching funds. Well, there are a lot of conservatives, including the types of folks that are, are in the legislature now, that no longer accept that argument. That, that from the conservative ideology perspective, that's just another excuse to grow government. That, that conservatives need to start standing up and telling the federal government, keep your money, we don't want to make government bigger, what part of that don't you understand? And, and this is just a trick um, to get us to make government bigger when we were elected to make government smaller. And you have had a lot of states and some high profile governors like Bobby Jindal and others that have been very, very vocal about saying, I will not expand government just because the federal government is offering to pay for it. So, if, if there's any evidence of, of movement away from that in the Kansas legislature, I'm not aware of it, but maybe Bird is. No, the, the short answer to that question is no. The, can, the Kansas will not, I can't just can't imagine Kansas uh, uh, picking up Medicaid. If they didn't do it in the last legislature, um, Brownback has just won re-election. No, uh, I, unfortunately, uh, I mean, it's really tragic because to qualify for Medicaid in Kansas, you have to have an incredibly low income. So, uh, so uh, really, a lot of people are left out, uh, and but I, and I just can't see that happening at all. Thank you. And this is on a completely different tact. It said, "What are the chances that the powers that be will push those who have made idiotic statements, Ray, Ray Merrick, uh, into the background, and uh, so that uh, we won't be embarrassed?" I think the recent. Uh, uh, statement by Merrick was that nobody who earns money that the government spends money on, teachers, firemen, policemen, people who fill potholes, all those kind of people don't really add to um, the government. So what's the chances that he won't be re-elected speaker? Well, uh, if, you, you know, if you want a good, good humor, I guess, uh, or, or a tragedy, you take your pick. Uh, tune in to the Kansas House uh, uh, because you've, you've, you've got you've got Ray, Ray Merrick, who, who many of you are unfortunately familiar with uh, in this neck of the woods. Uh, who I never understood how he got to be speaker in the first place, but just shows me I have a lack of political wit. I guess. Uh, and then he, and he, and he said, makes this. He didn't actually name firemen, policemen, no. but uh, you know, if you're a government, well, you add nothing. Uh, you know. Uh, as I said in the Facebook post, you know, the first government employee he sees every day when he looks in the mirror is himself. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I, the, the, the tragedy of the Kansas House right now is they've, they've won a big majority. Uh, he gets some uh, credit for that. And his only announced opponent right now uh, is, is one of the few legislators who could man really make Ray Merrick look good, uh, and that's Virgil Peck, uh, who, who was you know, thinking of shooting illegal aliens uh, from helicopters. Uh, so, I mean, that's where we've gone right now. Uh, you know, and I, I, let me, let me, I did a Facebook post Yesterday morning, and I, you know, it was something off the top of my head, uh, and it got a, a tremendous amount of comments, or whatever. And actually, most of them stayed on point, which was really remarkable. Uh, but I, I simply made the point of 
uh, that uh, uh, both uh, Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid uh, probably uh, should, should, should not run, uh, run for re-election. I particularly made the point with Pelosi. Uh, Nancy Pelosi is uh, she's 74. Uh, Okay, I don't want to be an ageist here, but I, I can see 74 from where I am. <laughs> All too closely. Under her. And, uh, but the point is that she, uh, she, uh, after 2008, uh, Nancy Pelosi stayed on in lead, as, in, as leader after 2010, 2012, 2014. I certainly don't hold her accountable for those losses in particular, uh, but I do hold her accountable for being the face of the Democratic Party, uh, of being there too long, of not giving people, younger people, uh, a chance. Uh, and, you know, if they, if, first of all, if those Republicans, uh, she would have, the speaker, if, if, either she would have been replaced or she would have resigned uh, after the 2010 election. She would have been gone. And that's what, that, that should have happened. I was stunned that she, that she, that she, that she uh, ran into, to become leader in 2010. Uh, but, but uh, we're not a parliamentary democracy, but in some ways the U.S. House is becoming closer and closer, uh, and, and uh, leaders, sh leaders should be responsible. And so uh, I, I do think it's important, you know, I, I want to segue from Ray Merrick to, to Nancy Pelosi, uh, <laughs> but I mean, I, I think that, that, that the, the, the caucus is, is, is should be accountable. Uh, my guess is, for many of those people, Ray Merrick is not their first choice. But you got to have you got to have someone to be someone. Uh, I think he's been accommodating to the very conservative right wing uh, majority in his in his caucus, and uh, uh, he'll continue to serve at least you know one more one more term. Good. Thank you. And here's another one that's uh, quite different. It said, uh, "Do you anticipate Senator Roberts fulfilling his six years?" And if he doesn't, who will replace him? <laughs> well, um, you know, I mean, he's, he'd be a, a spring chicken compared to a Strom Thurmond or, or a John Stennis or somebody like that. Uh, but uh, it's, it's not that unusual to have senators in their, in their 80s. Um, I don't know anything about his personal health. Although I will say that, that not only modern day politics, but politics even in the past, if there is a health problem and an opponent gets a hold of it, they will leak it. Uh, they might hide it, but they were the ones that leaked it. But if there was something we needed to know about the senator's health, we probably would know. Uh, his primary opponent was a doctor. Uh, but, uh, and, and so, I guess but the answer is, yeah, I think he will, barring any unforeseen circumstances. Um, and um, um, as far as the Senate, um, uh, who will be now? I mean, six years is an eternity in politics. You know, just less than four years before Barack Obama was elected president, he was an Illinois state senator. Um, so, so predicting politics more than a year or two out, I think we can do very immediate short-term predictions, like who will be the Speaker of the House, Ray Merrick. Or, or we can do very, very long-term predictions, like, you know, how's the country changing demographically and how will that affect politics? But it's the intermediate term gets a little weird. Um, as I say, um, I've, I'm particularly interested in, in, uh, in Mr. Kobach, and I definitely think he's quite ambitious. Now, whether he wants to be governor or senator, I don't know, but I don't think he wants to just uh, be Secretary of State indefinitely. Uh, and uh, so that's one to watch, but uh, beyond that, I wouldn't want to speculate. Yeah, I, 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 agree, I agree. I think that if, if Pat Roberts tells, holds up, that, that he'll, he will stay for six years. Uh, I mean, let's face it, uh, from, from my perspective, the reason that Pat Roberts ran this year was so, so he could be, have for six more years, he could be Senator Pat Roberts. I really saw no other reason uh, and he certainly gave none during the campaign, except he would cast a vote against Harry Reid. Okay, well that yeah, that's been sewed up now. So, uh, uh, you know, so and I think it's really hard to speculate uh, about about uh, you know the you know f future office holding stuff like that. All I would say right now, if you look across Kansas, uh, 
Democrat, uh, Republicans have any number. We might not agree with the, uh, with their politics, but but they have any number of people very capable of running a statewide race, from, from Kevin Yoder, uh, Mike Pompeo in the, in the House. I think Jenkins will probably stay there in the leadership. Not he was uh, uh Nobody talks about Derek Schmidt. Derek Schmidt was majority leader in the Senate. Uh, was one two terms as uh, Attorney General, uh, arguably after the governor, the most important uh, elected position in, in the state. Uh, so, uh, you've got, and, and obviously you've got Chris Kobach, uh, who, you know, is, is uh, you know, to say he's ambitious is, you know, understatement of the, of, of the year, but, but it's not like other people aren't ambitious. So, and I think if you look at the Democrats, I mean, you just go, who? I mean, it, it, it's, it's, really, it's really hard to, to see where someone's uh, you know, gonna, gonna, gonna pop up and, and be a, a really effective statewide candidate. Uh, so, um, uh, so that's something that, that you have to start you know, win, getting people winning elections in, in, in uh, aiming the city commissions and stuff, and then and, and state legislative seats, uh, certainly state senate seats in two years. Um, uh, to sort of to create a bench uh, uh, among uh, so for people who, who might well 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 challenge. So in, to use Michael's intermediate term notion, uh, very hard to see Democrats quickly rising back back up. I attend the uh, Moore Squared Banquet every year, and if you've not heard of that group, it's a it's a faith based social justice group here in Kansas City. They have a banquet every year, and they, they have these big name featured speakers. And they had uh, Reverend James Barber this year, who organized what they call Moral Mondays in North Carolina. And it's not the Moral Mondays of the religious right that they might hold. Uh, maybe they have a different day of the week. Maybe they have Friday. I don't know. But the Moral Mondays are to bring attention to poverty, to bring attention to voter disenfranchisement. This is in North Carolina. He works in North Carolina. Um, and so forth. And he's a very charismatic speaker, and, and he made a point that just really stuck with me. Uh, he said, Democrats rely on Messiah candidates. And again, this is from a man of faith who's, who's saying this. Uh, and actually, he's United Church of Christ, which is this church right here, also happens to be my own affiliation. But he said, you know, Democrats count on these Messiah candidates. This candidate is going to lead us to the promised land. Um, and I totally agree with that. Kathleen Zabelius, right? She I loved Kathleen Zabelius. She was wonderful. Um, but then she left the state, and, and then what? Oh, uh oh. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we only had, we bet all our money on one horse. And now she's off in Washington, D.C., or she was at that time. Um, you know, Paul Davis was you know, very well loved by Democrats, so much so that it actually created problems for other Democratic candidates trying to raise money because everybody was giving all their money to Paul Davis. And you had Gene Chodorf and some of these other candidates that, that didn't raise money until late, and a lot of it came in from out of state. Uh, because Paul Davis, everybody was betting on the Paul Davis horse, and he was a good candidate, and he did well, but he, he didn't win the election. and, and if Democrats, um, and, and I don't even know how moderates within the Republican Party fit, but somehow there's a role there too. But on the Democratic side, if, if they don't start building their infrastructure so that they can, for example, turn out voters in midterm elections, and so that they have a farm team of candidates that are running for city council, city commission, state rep, um, things like this down ballot state executive races, you know, this treasurer and things like that. If, if they don't have that and it, it keeps being this messiah candidate kind of phenomenon, I, I think that, that <coughs> Democrats will be slower to capture the emerging majority than, than if they think more in terms of infrastructure and not just in terms of swooning over a Kathleen Spelius or a Paul Davis. I, I, I would, I, I gotta say, that's the first time I've ever heard Paul Davis <laughs> referred to as a Messiah. <laughs> Again, we're swinging into a completely different question, and, and this is another good one. Great questions tonight, by the way. I am a first generation um, United States Mexican and look around to see that I am the minority here tonight. <laughs> How are political organizations going to take the Latino vote seriously and genuinely engage and empower Latinos in the political process? Any suggestions? 
uh, well, you know, I, I, I do think, I think that um, this is a long-term process. Uh, it, it doesn't occur <coughs> overnight. Um, I think that, by and large, uh, the Democratic Party nationally has done it, and certain parts of the Republican Party have as, as, as well. George W. Bush got a substantial number of, of Hispanic votes. Um, it seems to me it's a two-way street, uh, that the Hispanic community has to take seriously uh, the idea that its folks need to vote. They need to register, uh, they need, and, they, and they need, within their own community, to uh, get, out, get out their vote. Uh, and honestly, I, th I think they, they can't wait for the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, or anyone else uh, to, to move in that direction. Uh, I'm going to use an example here from around the world, from Kurdistan, uh, in uh, the, 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 in the, Kurd the Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, and I was there, uh, oh, now five years ago, uh, six years ago, and uh, on a State Department uh, speaking tour. And the Iraqi Kurds were amazing. Uh, they sought out foreign investment. They, they there had been a no-fly zone, so so Saddam could not uh, really get at them. Uh, and they built up their infrastructure, um, and and they were remarkable, toughest-minded people that I that I know. And I think you can see that uh, today as they've taken in all these Kurds from Syria and, and other parts of, of uh, that that region. Uh, but in a sense, that they, uh, I, I, I talked to a bunch of members of the Kurdish parliament, and just incredible people. And there were people from uh, women dressed in the most modern clothes and fashionable to, uh, to, to uh, Kurdish men in, in very traditional outfits, uh, baggy pants and the whole thing. Um, uh, and uh, we were, they, were, they had one question for me. What's going to happen when the Americans leave? What's going to happen when the Americans leave? And I said, look around. You've built an incredible society. You've got outside investment. You're building universities. It was safe in Kurdistan. I never had a worry uh, uh, safety-wise in, in, in Kurdistan. And you have done this. Well, in a sense, I, I honestly think that uh, the Latino community, uh, in a lot of ways, ha in a sense, is, is responsible. Uh, don't wait for the Democrats. I mean, Democrats hired a, a, an organizer this year, a really good one. Uh, uh, spent a lot of time out in Garden City in the southwest corner of the state. But don't wait for them. I mean, you're going to have a voice, have a voice. Get registered, get people to the polls. Uh, you do that. The, uh, Democrats will notice you. Everyone will notice you as 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 as, as a force. Uh, and so, in a sense, you know, wait, waiting for the Democrats, waiting for someone to come and, and organize you, uh, doesn't make sense. What makes sense is uh, organizing yourselves. Did you want to ask? Uh, I, I think that's well said. Um, Emporia is a really good example. This is a community where 52% of the enrollment in the local schools is Latino. Um, but uh, there is not one single Latino member of the city commission. Um, and, and the Latino vote in this community is, is not really a factor in the elections yet. Uh, for example, Speaker Pro Tem Peggy Mass, whose district includes part of Emporia, she had a real race this time. But again, there wasn't really a sense that the Latino vote was, was a big factor in, in this competitive race. And Bird mentioned Garden City. A liberal is another one. It's very, very rapidly changing. But, but I, having talked to political candidates who have run in Emporia, I think there's a real sense that there's a really tight-knit community within the Latino community in Emporia, and I'm sure liberal Garden City, other places. Um, there's a really tight-knit sense you can count on each other and they have each other's backs and, and there's a lot of friendship and community and celebration and, and shared faith um, but there's not that sense of connecting with the larger community with the rest of Emporia or Lyon County or Kansas and that includes voting unfortunately and um, you know it's 
like that 1950s song about the the fellow that had the summertime blues and he called his congressman and he said, I'd like to help you, but you're too young to vote. Um, it's just not realistic to think that you're going to get responsiveness if you don't vote. And we make it hard. And it's not just Colbach. We make it hard in this country. We have many more elections. We have primaries. We have local elections in weird times like April that, you know, 10, 20 percent of registered voters even show up. We have, uh, we have midterms. We have all these elections that a lot of other democracies don't fool with. And so it isn't easy. Um, but um, there's really no way other than, than somehow developing a culture of voting that, that's going to change that. What was the percent of vote anyway? in this state of registered voters. Do we know? Right about 50%. I think. About 50%. Yeah, right about 50%. So about half the people who were registered to vote didn't vote. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, not everyone's registered. Not everybody's registered. Okay, the next group of questions, there are several here about the judges' situation. Um, first one, um, is it likely that Brownback will be able to successfully redo the Supreme Court nomination process? And what is that process? And uh, what did you see as see a way forward? Well, that's a different one. But okay, go ahead. I, th I think it's one of the biggest agenda items uh, for the, the legislature this, this coming session will be taking a real run at uh, a constitutional amendment to uh, change the, 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 Supreme, the Supreme Court. You need two-thirds majority in each chamber to amend the Constitution, and it goes to a vote. Um, the the Brownback administration's argument is that the, the current uh, uh, nominating nominating committee you get three nominees and the governor picks one of those nominees uh, uh, is it produces liberals. Uh, I mean, it's to be to be sure, and I think their definition of liberal is anyone who who uh, who uh, votes as a judge. Uh, uh, against what I want, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and so, so that's why uh, the number of Democrats plus the number of moderate Republicans is, is so important. I think that you, uh, if there aren't 42 uh, to, to, to get to over one third of the state legislature, uh, I, and I think it's really close. Then I, then I think that there's a good chance that the Senate will do it in a heartbeat. Uh, so, so the, the real question is, is the uh, is, is the uh, the lower house uh, House of Representatives? I think there's a decent chance that that Brownback gets uh, uh, gets gets that amendment uh, on the on the ballot. If it gets on the ballot, I think it will probably pass. Uh, so, and I'm I'm you know I'm, I think it's a, it's a big change. Because uh, even if you had a Democratic governor, uh, he, uh, he requires uh, re uh, it, uh, approval by the Senate, confirmation by the Senate. Uh, you have not had a, a, a Democratic Senate in, in Kansas ever, as I recall. House, yes. Senate, no. So um, the, the odds are, are, are really stacked in, the, in, that, in that system. And the irony, of course, is as with Kobach and um, uh, voter registration, voter fraud, is that they're attacking a problem that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it, it, it's to the political advantage of Sam Brownback and, and, and uh, the Republican Party and, and the right wing of the Republican Party. Thank you. Um, we've also had um, several questions on, um, well, first of all, we've had a suggestion here about uh, uh, judges under attack and when they want to vote them out, what can our uh, mainstream do? And it said, make sure you let us know uh, which uh, judges that we need to keep in office. And if you uh, sign up for our web, if you go to our website or if you send a sign up for our emails, you will know that. So I just want to say that again. Um, on the, um, uh, another one, we've got several questions about same-sex marriage. Uh, the first one, why is Brownback and Schmidt so committed to fighting same-sex marriage, and can they continue to resist the Supreme Court rulings for marriage equality? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know Schmidt well enough, or don't know enough about him to say. I, and, and Brownback uh, 
seems to be very sincere in his pronouncements of, of his religious faith. That is not to say that all people of faith are anti-same-sex marriage. The pastor of this church has signed same-sex marriage licenses. Um, but uh, um, but Brownback's own faith is, is much more socially conservative. Um, but there's another issue of the cynic in me that there's a difference between position taking and, and outcome. So it may be that, Brown, I don't know, but it may be that Brownback or Schmidt or both are, are saying, look, it looks like there's going to be the court ruling in favor of same-sex marriage. We've already got counties. Uh, some other counties are now issuing the licenses. Lyon County issued its first license yesterday. So it's not just Douglas and Johnson counties anymore. Um, and uh, it's going to happen, but what positions do I need to take to, to shore up my electoral thing? electoral base. It's, it's kind of fun to watch the games over in Missouri where it's a little bit closer vote where you've got the um, um, Attorney General Coster who is an ex-Republican now a Democrat that wants to run for governor um, that almost really cut a deal with the city of St. Louis. Hey, you all issue some same-sex marriage licenses and I'll sue you. Uh, uh, and then we'll get this thrown into the courts and the courts will probably rule in your favor, but then I'll be on record as opposing it. You know, so it's, it's not really so much I'm against same-sex marriage as I want to be on record as being against same-sex marriage. Uh, and, and it may be that there's some of those same kind of considerations in Kansas of there's one issue is what are the courts going to do, another issue is what position taking do I want to do in order to shore up the base I need to win to win the primary and the election. Now what Brownback's political plans are at this point I don't know, but I think, I agree with Bert, I think Schmidt's very politically ambitious. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I do a follow-up question on that. Do you have any idea what the Supreme Court may do considering what their new issue is, the technicality that they're looking at in the Supreme Court about the same-sex marriage? In the Kansas Supreme Court? No, the... Uh, no, no, the... the, 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 <laughs> the, the, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, will probably take uh, that there's a difference in the circuits, uh, and, and it, I think it's pretty straightforward. And you're and you're going to have a, a, a Ted Olson and David Bowie's arguing the case again for for same-sex uh, marriage, a liberal and a conservative. Uh, uh, the technicality I think you're talking about in the Supreme Court is uh, the Affordable Health Care Act, where where you have. Uh, uh, a phrasing where it looks like uh, uh, state exchanges could not accept subsidies. And I, I would simply say th that uh, you have, for years and years and years, uh, conservative Republicans talked about activist judges. Uh, you now have the most activist Supreme Court in my lifetime. And my lifetime includes uh, the, uh, the Warren Court, uh, with Brown versus Board of Education uh, and, and uh, uh, Roe v. Wade, uh, both of which were activist decisions and, and, and probably in a way I agreed with. Roe v. Wade might not have been timely, but that's another matter. But, but uh, uh, this, this, this court has, has chosen with Citizens United, with B Bush v. Gore, uh, and now with, with the, the Affordable Health Care case. But how did? How did? Something like that. It, it, uh, if they decide it, we'll, we'll all know the name. Um, <laughs> but uh, they, they did not have to take this case at all. Uh, or they didn't have to take it, 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 it grab onto it. And, and, and they have. Now, what they'll do with it, I don't know. Justice Roberts clearly you know, was the swing vote to, to keep to uh, decide that the, 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 uh, the Affordable Health Care Act was constitutional. Does he come back and, and be the fifth vote again? I just, I just, I just don't know. But what I do know is this is, a, is you know, one more instance of, of really overreaching uh, activism on, on the Supreme Court. Do you have time for more questions? Just a few more. Okay. Um, let's see. 
Oh, here's a, here's a fun one. Uh, do you think pot will be legalized in Kansas to help fill the hole Brownback has blasted in the budget? <laughs> um, I do not. I think that um, you know a lot of it again is is indicative of the electorate uh, in uh, Colorado and Washington State, the two states that, that were the first ones to legalize recreational use. Those two states have some of the youngest electorates in the United States. This is an age issue. So the same-sex marriage, the one you just asked about. These are age-based issues. These, these are issues where, uh, I don't know where the cutoff is, is 40, 45, 50, somewhere in there. Um, but, but, but at and above, whatever that cutoff is, we'll say it's 45. Uh, there's one set of opinions. And at and below, there's a completely separate set of opinions. And I, I really think that the age of the electorate explains a lot of what happened in Colorado and Washington State. Um, now, does that mean that in five, ten years that we'll see similar effects in other states? It could very well. It could very well, just as same-sex marriage seems to be spreading more and more, and you even have young Republicans now saying either we're openly for same-sex marriage or we just don't think it's any big deal, let's get back to doing economics issues and forget about this, which horrifies the older Republicans, of course. But, but it, this, is, this is an issue where there's a huge cleavage based on age. Now, Kansas is an older state, so Kansas is probably not going to be one of the trendsetter states. Now, if they could just legalize in Douglas County, Maybe you can see, see that bass, I don't know. But I, don't, I think statewide, I think that's a ways away. See, it used to be everyone, everyone make jokes about Johnson County. Now, obviously, it's, it's Douglas. Uh, I'd say it's a little different model here. I, 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 just, I, I just had a you know, revelation. Uh, uh, um, no, I, I think the model is not probably uh, gay marriage. Uh, I, I think the model for uh, legalization of marijuana uh, may well be um, legalized gambling. Yeah. Uh, and now think about Kansas. I came here in 1979. Couldn't buy a drink. I mean, you know, <laughs> you're probably easier to buy pot than it was a drink, uh, at least in the uh, and, and, you know, you, you, had, you had a change in the liquor laws, you had gambling, gambling came, in first, uh, Indian, Indian <coughs> casinos, then, then, then state-owned casinos. Uh, in a state that, you know, is, is historically, you know, pretty morally conservative. Uh, the there, but they are certainly revenue enhancers. Uh, it also, uh, I, and I think one reason you could do this in, in a Republican state is that there, with, uh, uh, with, with marijuana, not only is it, it the uh, enhance the enhancement of, of revenue, uh, but it also there's there's a, a, a bit of a you know, not a bit there's a a fair amount of a libertarian element to it, yeah. and, and and I do think that you might find some very conservative uh, right wing Republicans just sort of shrugging their shoulders. Uh, well, there's a revenue source. It happens anyway, you know, uh, why not? I mean, it's less government, we won't enforce. Uh, and honestly, it would be a boon to keeping people out of prison. So, you know, I, I, I would say that, that it's, it's, a lot, it's more like legalized gambling than, 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 than same-sex marriage. And, and, That's right. and, 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 and uh, one of the things that happens with gay marriage is we really start to find out that, oh, uh, Oh, so and so is gay, or his son is gay, or whatever. Well, I don't care where you live. You know, you know if you're a parent, you're pretty. You know, sooner or later, you're, you're. Oh, Johnny was smoking some pot. You know, on the great scale of things, how how serious is that? Um, you know, maybe you know, not as serious as as, as you might, as you might think. So you, we've all had experiences uh, with that to 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 an to an extent, and. Uh, I think that kind of familiarity along with the revenue potential is possible. We have a, had a number of questions about teachers and the future of teachers in this state. And um, I'm going to combine it with another one uh, because you've also talked about young people and getting, getting those people engaged. And you're both professors. You both have students. What do you think would engage the students 
uh, and how you get them to become engaged in what's going on so that they young more of the young people vote. And is that really the issue? Is it because we have more older people voting or do we have not enough young people engaged? Or how do, how do we fix that? And then the other part is about future teachers. I'll jump on that one. I teach at Emporia State, which is known for producing good teachers, and we're very proud of that. Now, I, I'm obliged to tell you, we also have some other really good programs in Emporia State, including our <laughs> political science major, which is a really strong and growing program. Um, it's, uh, we actually get pigeonholed sometimes at the teacher school, but nevertheless, we do produce good teachers, and we're, I mean, this is just the teeniest, teeniest little rumbling. Um, but, but we're starting to get some students mentioned to us, you know, I'm thinking about moving to another state after I get my teaching certificate. Colorado's looking really good, right? Now. <laughs> um, um, I would say for the first time in my lifetime, and I'm a Kansas City native, um, I would say a, a prospective young teacher would be better off in Missouri. Um, and I never thought I would say that. I'm a proud Missouri native, but I never really thought we'd be saying go go east, young man, or go east, young woman, for a better teaching job in Missouri. But but I would say right now you'd be better off to to cross the state line. Um, again, a lot of it depends on what the community is. Uh, Johnson County will step up, raise your own property taxes. I don't even want to think about how much you're paying in property taxes, but but the schools will make it. Um, but what's going to happen in Emporia? What's going to happen in, in Cherokee County? What's going to happen in Fort Scott? What's going to happen in Garden City? That's what I'm really worried about because they don't have the property tax base. And, and I'm not going to say that there's this wave of young future teachers at Emporia State or anywhere else that are, are packing. But, but we are starting to hear some of our higher performing students start to say, you know, kind of think about maybe going to another state. Is there reciprocity of teaching certification? What would I have to do to get certified in another state? You need, these folks are not necessarily committed to living the rest of their lives in the state of Kansas. Uh, and so that's one thing to think about. Now you asked about young voters. Uh, it reminds me in 2010, which was an election with an outcome a lot like 2014, um, I was asking a student who happened to be a Democrat, and I, he said, you know, I'm just, I'm so outraged, I'm going to vote, I'm going to vote Democratic. I said, well, do you think most of your friends are going to vote Democratic in the midterms? And he said, Professor Smith, I don't think most of my friends know that there are midterm elections. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, we can't overestimate the political sophistication of people that don't sort of follow politics as a career or a hobby. Um, even be an awareness of the, the fact that there are midterms, when they are, the procedures for voting, <laughs> which are more complicated, thanks to Mr. Kobach, uh, uh, the uh, importance of them, what offices are on the ballot. Um, we're not actually there yet. We're not there with lower income voters, and we're not there with younger voters. I mean, just, just the basic fundamental things like members of the U.S. House are all reelected every two years, or the difference between the state legislature and Congress. Um, we're not there. We're not there. Of course, our political science majors uh, could could give this lecture just as well or better than we can. But but with a lot of other students, it's it's still we're still working uphill. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I think that's most of the questions that we've got here. Um, uh, here's one. It says, do moderates really vote for Democrats, or do they revert in the privacy they're voting for? And I think some of you have talked about that. And, and, I mean, I don't know if that's been a last question or not. I mean, I really think that's, I, I think for people who are here tonight, and have no idea what the breakdown is of party registration or, or what you consider yourselves, but, but, and we did hear about, about, uh, the successes of the mainstream coalition to, to, to start the, the, the evening off. Uh, but, but honestly, I, I mean, I think that, uh, that really thinking hard ab about uh, the, the, you know, the, the role of the mainstream coalition, the role of moderates, uh, and being a moderate is really tough sometimes. Uh, and, and I think that 
you can you can uh, operationalize this moderation in in very energetic ways, as obviously many of you, many many of you have. Uh, but I, I guess I guess I think that uh, one of the things I don't want to start a, a huge discussion here uh, uh, or. Uh, or a small moderate riot, uh, <laughs> but but I mean, at some point, uh, I think a moderate Republicans have to think: Is there any place for me? Is is this party that I've grown up in? Uh, you know, is is there any place for me? Uh, it's, it's not the party that it was ten or twenty or thirty uh, years ago. Uh, one of my best friends, political friends, at least in, in Kansas, Sandy Prager, who I have immense admiration for. And I think she's been a terrific insurance commissioner, uh, she, and and uh, she's 70 years old this year. Uh, I think had she, it was 10 years, and, and previously, every time we have, she was ever approached about running for office as a Democrat, switching, she said, ah, oh, my father would be spinning in his grave. <laughs> and I, I, I remember hearing her say that. Uh, and, and we said, well, I, That'd be kind of fun to see him spin, Sandy. Uh, <laughs> but had she been 10 years younger, she'd been 60, not 70, mm -hmm. I think Sandy Prager would have run for uh, governor as a Democrat. Mm -hmm. And I think she would have not looked back. Uh, well, uh, I don't want to push anybody in any direction, but maybe, you know, uh, if you're on the fence, maybe it's time not to look back. Uh, but, uh, you know, everybody's got to, you know, I think that, you know, you're all working the same direction. You can do it in different ways. And I certainly don't want to, you know, be, I don't want to be partisan. Uh, but, but I do think logistically, uh, tactically, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, the, the whole thing of, of the Republican Party moving farther and farther to the right is, uh, it is. I think that is where the Republican Party is in Kansas, and where it's going to stay for for a very long time. Thank you. Um, of course, you made a lot of age references tonight, and uh, uh, if you really want to feel old, uh, think about this: in the next couple of years, we will have students in college that never lived in the 20th century. <laughs> uh, just uh, just uh, four, four more years. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, wow. You. you know, but and so I was I was given this uh, lecture today in state and local government class, and they just sort of hit me. I said, "Do you? I bet you all talking to the students probably you have never heard of this. You probably think I'm crazy. But 30 years ago." No one would think you were crazy if you talked about a conservative Democrat or a liberal Republican. You know, you'd have a, a John Lindsay, the mayor of New York City, was a liberal Republican. Of course, the Rockefellers. Everybody knows about Rockefeller Republican. It wasn't considered weird. A whole bunch of New Englanders, you know, liberal Republicans, certainly lots of moderates as well, um, and, and even probably some Kansans. I mean, Governor, I'd say Governor Bennett, certainly by today's standards, would be considered pretty liberal. Uh, he was a proud Republican, and of course, you had this huge. Um, conservative Democrat base in the South, all the, the yeah. solid South, Southern states, very conservative Democrats. And, and uh, that just seems weird today. Uh, and we have a whole generation of college students, even the ones that are politically astute, that have never heard of such a thing, unless they study history, which I'm proud to say some of them do. Um, <laughs> the the, the uh, parties are so coalesced around ideology now. They're, they're not coalitions of interest groups, especially the Republican Party. The Democratic Party still a little bit. It's not a coalition of interest groups as much anymore. It's not about, well, if we get the farmers over here and the unions over there and the teachers over here and business over there. It's it's yeah. it's this political ideology so that you can have a, a Tim Hules camp that comes from one of the highest the districts that's one of the highest recipients of farm subsidies in America who's against farm subsidies. Right. Um, and and that would be unthinkable for, say, Jerry Moran who used to be the congressman still, uh, from that district and now is, is a U.S. Senator. Um, so I, I think that whether it's a good thing, bad thing, a little bit of both, I think that, that the model of the parties being these sort of sorts of coalitions is going to have to give way to this, 
this ideological polarity. Uh, which, which party's ideology are you closer to? And as I, I wrote my newspaper column this weekend, the, the myth of the wave of independent voters is pretty much debunked by the election results. It didn't work for Orman. He couldn't match Davis's vote total, and Davis was running on the Democratic label in a Republican state. And, and I wouldn't put a lot of hope in the uprising of the angry moderates. Uh, I know that Michael Bloomberg and other people say, oh boy, when the moderates get together, we're going to change the world. But uh, I don't see it happening. I see a very partisan and partisan divided electorate. And yeah, it kind of stinks to have to choose sides. With, you know, I understand the virtue of saying, I want to be an independent, I want to pick and choose, but you know, even independent party leaners these days, they lean pretty far. <laughs> there are very few truly right in the middle independents anymore. And, and in some ways that's too bad, but that's reality. Let's give those people a big hand. And now I want to introduce the um, uh, Brandy Fisher, who's the executive director of Mainstream. Brandy. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. It's um, I don't know. Right after the election, people were like, "Oh, I'm, I'm giving up." And well, for me, that was never an option. One, because I have two kids in public school, and uh, two, because. Uh, all my friends, all the friends in this room, the partner organizations we work with, that was never an option for them. So I see the emails coming out from our you know, friends at the league, or um, Women for Kansas, and Game On, and everyone is right in the game. And it's because, uh, because we have a lot worth fighting for. And uh, you know, uh, Burdett, when you said, you know, I don't know who you all are, I mean, truthfully, if you ask a, uh, a strong, moderate Republican in the room here, they'll probably tell you this room's full of Democrats, but if you ask a, a strong Democrat in the room, they'll say all mainstream's all moderate Republicans. <laughs> so um, I, I think we're doing something right, and I'm holding out for the moderate riot. So, <laughs> so. I just want to thank all of you for giving your evening tonight. Um, mainstream members have given and all of you, I mean, countless hours and dollars um, over the last many months uh, with your involvement in campaigns and uh, with some of you uh, even giving the ultimate sacrifice of running for office. So thank you. I know we have a handful of legislators in the room tonight. Thank you for being here tonight. For Main Street's part this past campaign season, um, we really branched out. We got in the game in a way that we never had before. And we really um, activated our base through our PAC in a handful of key races. And I'm thrilled to say that, um, that we held, as Cheryl said, we held all those incumbent seats despite the multitude of attack mailers that came out after them, after some of our stalwarts that have been such friends to mainstream and such friends to public education and, uh, and just a voice for good government. So uh, I thank you because we couldn't have done that with all of your support. We, uh, gosh, you know, it's where, where do you start? And you just feel, you feel so hopeful. And I think we have such an opportunity, all of us together, to um, really hold the current administration accountable and to say, okay, we've gone down this path and now we are going to hold you to it and uh, we're going to be watching. And we've done that in the past with our, our weekly updates. I hope all of you are getting the emails every Friday. Um, weekly updates, our legislative updates, our uh, work on social media. If you're not, sign up tonight. If you are, let everyone you know um, know that we send these out, send them to our website. Anyone can receive the weekly updates. I will always remember when uh, one of our legislators said to us, um, there was a hearing, I think it was on uh, uh, maybe the scholarship bill for funding, and she said, you know, you've got to get people there because the other side is always in the room. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what we have to collectively do is be in the room. So we have to be in those committee hearings. We have to be emailing our legislators, calling our legislators, some of them aren't always responsive, then we need to call and email more, collectively calling, being visible, and holding them accountable. Mainstream is committed to doing that and to being a resource for all of you to help you to do that. But we're a coalition, and it's not about a small board or staff, but it's about all of us 
working together and, uh, and, uh, and hold, like I said, holding the administration accountable. Um, I, I think that's it. We, uh, we are so thrilled to have you and it's great to listen to the two of you, but I hope that you all will join us across the street. We will uh, continue the dialogue and the conversation at the tavern in the village, either in the bar area or for those that haven't had dinner, can eat dinner. But before you go, um, just a quick question, because I will not be able to walk out of here uh, without asking, promise my board chair, that I would ask um, who in the room here, are, I see some new faces, members, mainstream members, if you could raise your hand. Keep them up. New ones or old ones? Well, if you're not current, it's at least in the back, we'll take your check. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> mainstream members. So, what's the question? Who are you? Who do you want? Are we members? Put, hands up. put yeah. members' hands up. Oh, you're a okay. member, put your hands up. <laughs> you make our work possible. We wouldn't. Oh, keep them up there. Or switch arms, they're getting tired. We wouldn't be here tonight without each of you. If you are sitting next to someone who doesn't have their hand up, they're either one, desperately waiting for you to ask them to join, and apparently the ask at the front door wasn't strong enough, or they're a mole, and ask them too. <laughs> Maybe we run them over tonight. Um, help us grow the network, follow us. <coughs> this room, I think we have 150, 160 in here, so when we convene again in January, we might outgrow this space but let's have 300. Bring somebody with you and introduce them to Mainstream and uh, help us grow. Thank you for being involved, for your activism, for your voting, and for coming out tonight. Thank you.